All right, I'm going to timestamp some of the fights in the description below. All right, starting off with Chris Curtis versus Kelvin Gastelum. Chris Curtis, I think he thinks it was a robbery at one. In my opinion, you might not like it. I thought it was a clear 29-28 for Kelvin Gastelum, winning round one and round two. And round three was a clear 10-9 for Chris Curtis. And if you want to give him round two for Chris Curtis, making it a 29-28 for him, which I disagree with, you're basing it off the second half of round two. Because the first half, Kelvin Gastelum was winning it, and he did a good job of using the leg kicks, circling around, and he had very good footwork. Remember, this guy could have beaten Israel Adesanya. And when I say could have, I believe he went for a takedown and he bottled it. So, bear that in mind. In this fight, Chris Curtis... He was looking to throw more like body shots, come up to the head. Not that many leg kicks, but he's not that type of guy. The same problems keep happening in his fights. He's a good fighter, he's got power, but at times he's just inactive and it's weird because he trains with Sean Strickland. Sean Strickland is an active fighter. You don't stand there and not throw anything, but at times Chris Curtis was doing that. So I think Sean Strickland needs to drill it into him to start being more active. And yes, Chris Curtis threw more strikes in the fight. But if you want to talk about the strikes that landed with volume, it's Kelvin Gastelum. So that's another reason why I thought he won round one and round two. Chris Curtis has moments in fights where an opponent might get a bit too complacent, throws a leg kick like Kelvin Gastelum did and got cracked with, I believe, a one-two or just a right straight. And a lot of fighters, for example, Joaquin Buckley, when he got hit with that right straight, what happened? He went out cold. But Kelvin Gastelum, despite him having a mouth surgery, he ate that punch and he didn't go down. I was very surprised because it looked powerful. It backed him up a little bit. But then Chris Curtis is one of those fighters. If he catches you like that, if you don't go down, he isn't going to do like what Alex Pereira does, where he'll walk you down and try and capitalize on that moment. So that's another thing that I think he should work on in his fights. So yeah, I do think Kelvin Gastelum won that fight. And it won't be a robbery. It's a close fight. The 30-27, you could argue that's a robbery. It should be 29-28 in all scorecards. Because there's no way Kelvin Gastelum won that third round. It looked like he was coasting a little bit. Chris Curtis was becoming more active. But in general, Kelvin Gastelum, with the volume, was more effective than Chris Curtis with his volume. Rule Roses Jr. versus Christian Rodriguez. Well, straight away, very disappointing. Like... Believe it or not, Raw Roses Jr. only landed two strikes in the entire fight. And it'll be a learning experience because he went out there and tried to do what Mirab does. Just constant pressure. But instead of trying to grapple with him, he was looking to get the submission and he gassed out. And I think because he was fighting in Florida in a big arena and he's young, he hasn't built up the experience. He might have panicked a little bit and wanted to get the finish then early. But you can't do it over a guy like Christian Rodriguez. Like, I didn't pick him to win, I'm going to be honest with you. I picked Rule Roses Jr. And looking at that now, I don't know why. He's too young. This guy was 25, more experienced. Fought Jonathan Pierce, who's about to fight Bryce Mitchell. Lost the fight, but he didn't get finished. And on the feet, he can strike. He's got jujitsu, And he was able to just scramble his way out of positions, defend against the rear naked choke attempts of Rule Roses Jr. And end up getting loads of control time over him. So round one, I actually did give that to Rule Roses Jr. Because he got in like... Almost the deep rear naked choke. Rodriguez defended well, but round two, you could see the cardio might have been getting a little bit worse because now he was able to stay on top of Rule Roses Jr. And at that point, I was thinking, in the third round, if you don't win that round, he's going to lose the fight. And what happened? Desperate to get the takedown gives away a position. And he only got three out of 16 takedowns. And again, I know he's young, but a lot of people are thinking he's arrogant. But it's because he's young, he's confident, and that's good. But some people will say this is a humbling experience, and it probably was. Well, it was, yeah. And it just seems like he's so predictable with the takedowns that Rodriguez can stop it every time. And the UFC are trying to promote this kid because he's very young. But I think he's got to be more patient when he grapples now, like not forcing to get the submission. It's a bit like Hamzat Shemaev at the start, trying to rush and get that finish, which you could argue he still does now, apart from the Gilbert Burns fight. Rule Roses Jr. has got to be patient, I'm sorry. Because looking at that, it was disappointing because I thought he was going to go out there and try and fight his way to a decision. And he didn't want to strike with this guy, it was obvious, because he knows he's got power. He hasn't had any KO finishes in the UFC, 
But in the amateurs and some of his other fights, you can see he got a few KOs. And even on the feet at times when Raw Roses Jr. tried to strike, he did get caught, like got caught with a flying knee, I believe it was, or just the normal knee when he shot to go for a takedown because it's too predictable. He could see it coming. So it's unfortunate for him, but he's got to go back and change up that style a little bit. Like A lot of people underestimated this guy, I feel like. Maybe it's just me, but I think a lot of people did, in my opinion. Right, Kevin Holland versus Santiago Ponzinibbio. You know what? In the first round, Ponzinibbio was attacking that leg heavily. And you had Kevin Holland popping out that jab, maybe mixing up a sidekick to the body. And then near the end of the round, you see Santiago Ponzinibbio catches Kevin Holland's leg. Massive mistake. Just starts swinging some creative back fist towards his chin and drops him down to the ground. And that's one thing I'm thinking about. Ponzinibbio now. He is declining rapidly in fights. I just don't think he's the same fighter anymore. The leg kicks look good, but jabbing wise, it's going to be hard to close the distance against Kevin Holland. Yeah, but I don't think he can compete at the top level anymore. I'm sorry. Yes, he beat Morona, but he was getting dominated all three rounds until like however long it was until he got finished and just came out of nowhere with the overhand right and then put him down. He was getting pieced up by Morona. And I thought Morona would go out there and just try and grapple with him. But on the feet, outstriking him. And now you have Kevin Holland knocking him out like that, making him fall flat in his face. And then he goes to finish him. And then Ponzinibbio gets up and he's like, it was an early stoppage. It weren't an early stoppage. And if he watches it back now, he'll know it weren't an early stoppage. Kevin Holland, he had to win that fight. If he didn't, it would look bad because he's 36 years of age, Ponzinibbio. On the way out of the sport, in my opinion. Holland's still young. He would want to fight Masvidal, but we know he's retired, so I doubt that's going to happen. So I wouldn't mind seeing Kevin Holland fight a guy like Michael Chiesa or maybe even a Jack Della Maddalena. That would be an interesting fight. Or if he wants to get onto better form, fight Neil Magny, who you might call a journeyman. But if he wants to take a tougher fight, I'd want to see him fight someone like Jack Della Maddalena. Right, Rob Font versus Adrian Yanez. If you're talking about Kelvin Gastelum being fired tonight, this was another good one as well. I know it didn't last more than a round. I picked Rob Font to win and I thought we would have seen the same issues Yanez suffered against Randy Costa. Randy Costa is no longer in the UFC. It's the jab. The jab of Rob Font was causing problems for Adrian Yanez because Adrian Yanez was allowing Rob Font to go first. So if you can use that jab on Yanez, because his head movement isn't as good as what you would think, even though he's a boxer, he's prone to being popped back with the jab. And that can accumulate volume, which you can use to set up with another strike. But then again, Rob Font is getting old now. I think he's going to struggle to compete in the top five, but in the top ten, he might do okay. And the reason I say okay is because he's got that good jab. But when he fights against the guys with loads of power, the problems will be there, like we saw with Marlon Vera. I don't think his skin reacts well to punches anymore. And that might sound weird, but look at his face, like only around into the fight, or maybe like two minutes into it, there was like a cut underneath the eye, and it looked quite bad. And you look at that Marlon Vera fight, all that damage he did to him, he's prone to cuts. And Adrian Yanez, the problem with him was, he was allowing Rob Font to go first. When Yanez was going first at the start of the fight, he had his moment. He didn't look like he was going to knock out Rob Font, but he was landing effectively. Like, he caught him with a good uppercut in that fight as well, in the pocket. But then when he started backing up, letting Rob Font dictate the tempo, using that jab, which he can do effectively, he's backing up Adrian Yanez, and it's harder to counter-strike against him because Rob Font's got that high block. He's always protecting himself from the counter-right or left hook. And when he's getting hurt, you can see Adrian Yanez. He's got a lot of power in his hands. He likes the swing, like, look at that Tony Kelly fight swinging wild punches but when you do that against a guy who's got dynamic striking like Rob Font it will open up those punches through the center because if you aren't moving your head and you're swinging wide shots that straight hand down the middle is always there and what happened was he overswung in the counter exchanges and Rob Font set up that right hook perfectly and it looked like a brutal shot because he went flying down to the ground and then got grounded and pounded and I just think that was inevitable to happen because You've got Rob Font, a guy who likes to pop out that jab. And Adrian Yanez, I'd say his weakness can be the jab at times, like we saw with Randy Costa. I know I'm repeating it, but I'm just saying that's when weakness with him. He's got to work on moving that head more and more off the centre line. And again, it's a good win for Rob Font. I do think for his brain and his skin, he should retire, but I don't think he will because he's still got the talent. 
but I think he might struggle with the fighters in the top five. But top ten, I still think he might be able to compete with some of them. Not all. Not people like Umar. He won't be able to beat a guy like that. But maybe a Jonathan Martinez or a guy like that. Or maybe a Chris Gutierrez. Okay, Gilbert Burns versus Masvidal. I'm going to quickly talk about Gilbert Burns. Does he deserve a title shot? In my opinion, no. Not before Colby. And let me just make the statement right here. Colby should have drew with Usman in that second fight. I do believe that. And then he just beat George Masvidal in a more dominant fashion in a five-round fight compared to Gilbert Burns, who is fighting a worse Masvidal, although he was bad in the Colby Covington fight. This is an even worse Masvidal where he's probably not even motivated to even fight anymore because he makes so much money, no rivalry like he had with Colby. There was no like desperation to win it. He just wanted to go out there and win, obviously, but there was no like desperate need so he just retired but looking at his body and I know he's never been the guy to be in perfect shape compared to the younger days but something about him just looked off when I saw him at the weigh-ins and, and he was getting into like these altercations in the street before the fight like he's trying to do street fights before he's even fought Gilbert Burns but now he's retired it's a good thing he did and yes he's a journeyman but he was a good fighter at the end of the day being able to submit a guy like Michael Chiesa beating Ben Asker and Nate Diaz and having that good 2019. But Gilbert Burns, he beat Neil Magny, but again, gatekeeper. George Masvidal, an old guy as well. And then he lost to Hamzat Shemaev. But I'm just saying, Colby deserves it first. Burns wants to be the backup fighter. Well, he wants to have a title shot, but he wouldn't mind being the backup fighter. And whoever wins that fight, he fights the winner of that. That makes sense. And he doesn't deserve it over Colby, because look when Gilbert Burns fought Kamara Usman, got knocked out with a power jab. Well, not knocked out, TKO'd with a power jab. Colby should have drew in the second fight. First fight, back of the headshots, should have went to a decision, and then Usman would have won. But I think based on that performance, I would definitely give Colby out over Burns. Like, in the first round, believe it or not, he actually won that round. You might laugh at that. Yes, Gilbert Burns won round two and round three by grappling him, and almost like putting him away in the third round, getting that right straight down the pipe, kind of like wobbled Masvidal a little bit, stunned him, put him against the fence. He didn't capitalize on it and finish him, mixed up the takedowns, and then finishes the round in a good position. But in round one, Masvidal was doing well, but the cardio and takedown defense has gotten worse. I didn't think it was that bad. I thought just because it's Colby, you know what he's like. He'll do it to most fighters. He'll grapple you and put a different pace on you where having a takedown defense would be hard to use because he's got that good grappling. But in this fight, Burns can grapple, but it's not Colby level. And he just got taken down four times out of six attempts. And he didn't defend against them like he would used to do. He's like trying to pull a guillotine almost when he was getting taken down once. And on the feet first round, I like the leg kicks he was using. A kick to the body, keeping it at range, doing a good job of doing that. But then, as the round got on, he was actually forcing Gilbert Burns to miss a lot of strikes because, again, he swings a lot of wild overhands and stuff like that where he did catch him twice with two powerful, like, one overhand and I can't remember what the other one was, but it was a really powerful strike that evoked a reaction out of the crowd. But it weren't, like, a very convincing performance to the point where I'm, like, give him it over Colby. If he went out there round one, finished him, I'd be like... Maybe there's an argument to give him the title shot over Colby, but we know that won't happen. So he should get the title shot after Colby fought Leon Edwards. Right, Alex Pereira Adesanya. Right, I made the breakdown on it earlier, about five hours ago, I can't remember. Alex Pereira most likely is going to move up to light heavyweight. And I do think that's the smart decision. I don't think he wants to fight a middleweight anymore. He will not get an immediate rematch with Adesanya, although you might think he deserves it because it's 3-1 and one right now, 1-1 one and one in MMA. Usually if it's 1-1, one and one, they'll do another fight. But if this fight's going to happen again, it'll be down the road. Where Alex Pereira, if he can get a few more wins at light heavyweight, or maybe at middleweight, which I don't think he'll do, because I think light heavyweight, he'll be heavier in that weight class, and you might prefer it. Fighting like a Jamal Hill in the future, maybe a Yuri Prohaska, and whatever happens in that fight, if he gets some good form, fight Adesanya for the third time. And he might even want to try and become a double champ or something like that. But that will be hard because you've got Mohamed Gedanak alive. And I think that will be one of the hardest fights for Alex Pereira. Because although he's not a finisher in terms of grappling, I could see him causing problems for Alex Pereira. Because if he can get him down to the ground, he will finish him in my opinion. Because he's so strong on the ground. Alex Pereira, we haven't seen too much of his grappling that much. 
only because he's had like two fights in the UFC. And I don't want to bring up the Quimel Tony fight because that was his debut and it was years back. But we didn't see any of that in this fight. And a lot of us were thinking, is Israel Adesanya going to go out there and turn into Israel Namagedov or something like that and grapple with him and just try and grind away to a decision panicking? But no, in this fight, I had Adesanya actually losing. And if it was going to go into the third round, he would have been losing on the scorecards. But I'm not going to take any credit away from Adesanya's win because I did want him to win and he did win. Using the leg kicks and even if you want to look at the um, significant strikes, he had more than Adesanya. So in the light heavyweight division, I think he should fight a guy like Jamal Hill, but he won't get it because Yuri Prohaska is probably going to look to fight him next if he comes back. Or maybe a Muhammad Gedanak alive. So maybe we could see a Jan Blahovic versus Alex Pereira. But you might laugh at this, but Jan Blahovic could beat Alex Pereira with the takedowns. Definitely. And light heavyweight, you might laugh at this. They've got a few good grapplers in that division which could cause them problems. And imagine if we saw Alex Pereira versus Paul Craig. It would be a Paul Craig thing to do to finish Alex Pereira with a submission, which he could do, but I would pick Alex Pereira to win that fight because I think he'd look to KO him early and he'd put the pressure onto him early. And sometimes Paul Craig can start off quite slow and not shoot to get the takedown like he did against Johnny Walker. And when he got the um, takedown attempt, he just got smashed to the head. And any shot Alex Pereira hits on Paul Craig, he will go out cold. But I doubt that fight will ever happen, but it would be an entertaining fight to watch, in my opinion. So, probably going to look to fight one of the guys in the top six in light heavyweight. But I think that's going to be a harder division, maybe, for Alex Pereira because of the grapplers in there. Like Yuri Prohaska, Alex Pereira, in my opinion, is the better striker. But what Yuri Prohaska could do is mix up a takedown. Yuri's only attempted one takedown and he got it on Dominic Reyes, which... Looks quite impressive, considering John Jones struggled, but again, Yuri Pahaska wasn't really looking to take him down. He did get a good one minute of control time, which you might not think is too good, but I think that's all right over Dominic Reyes. Because believe it or not, he got a similar amount of control time compared to John Jones, who only got one minute and 41 in a five round fight. Remember that. But if they kept it on their feet, Yuri Prohaska and Alex Pereira, Alex Pereira would definitely win that fight. Leg kicking away at Yuri Prohaska. Both got loads of power. And I think it would end up with a finish for Alex Pereira. Or if Yuri Prohaska was going to win, it would end up with a finish. That's why I think that fight should happen in the future. So for Alex Pereira, it's a bit disappointing, but he did beat Adesanya before, so he shouldn't be too negative. But I'm glad Adesanya won. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for watching. Talk to you soon.